of every village, every city soaring tower. Empty people live in darkness, every minute, every hour. Hear the cry of desperation from a billion broken hearts. With a need so great, where do we even start? Let it start with me. For everyone, I don't want to miss my mission in the plan that you've begun. You have promised to go with me to the edges of it all. I change everything that keeps me from your call. Let it start with me. Open up my eyes, fill my heart with your compassion. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning on this Tuesday morning. It was pretty rainy earlier today. I don't know whether it's still raining out there right now or not, but we are here and we are together. And good morning, good morning to all of you wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. And here we are. And I say good morning to Miss Debbie, who's the first one to pop up there. Good morning to you. And then Miss Carolyn, God bless you, sister. It's good to see you this morning. There is the double B's, Brenda and uh, and, and Brent. And uh, by the way, uh, I'm going to talk to you about this VR stuff, all right? And Miss Sherry, good morning, my uh, dearly beloved brothers and sisters. It is such a privilege and great joy to celebrate Almighty God with you as we begin this day in his presence. Isn't that the truth? Amen and amen. And Therese, wow, fashionably on time this morning. God bless you. God. <coughs> it's good to have you, my friend. It is good. It's good. Miss Linda, God bless you. It's good to see you this morning. Let's, uh, well, I guess let's jump in and get ourselves started. Miss Terry, good morning to you. Use my left hand if I can get that to work. There we go. I can give that back to you. Good morning to you. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, as we open up, as we get ourselves started this morning, uh, we're going to uh, uh, talk about fulfilling uh, the call to missions. And uh, we've looked at a great many things. Sunday, we talked strictly about lostness. 
and our video was about the lostness of, uh, of the world. And uh, of course, we see uh, you know all of this. Whenever we look at a mission video, uh, well, I got to tell you, we don't even have to do that. All we got to do is go to the mall or walk down the street, go to the grocery store, look around us. If we will walk around with our eyes open, with our ears open, attuned to what's going around us, we will see the lostness of the world around us. Uh, we lose perspective of that sometimes because we live in uh, a more prosperous society. We don't, uh, uh, for some reason, we don't get caught up with the concept of the lostness of man in the same way. Uh, uh, but that doesn't make it any different. That's why I use the rich young ruler for one reason, uh, as an example of lostness. Uh, he may have had all of this world's goods. He may have been comfortable... In in that respect to things, but beyond that, he was still uh, lost, uh, gained the whole world, but lose his own soul. Uh, yesterday, on Monday, we looked at Michaela and, and Justin Nippers, and I got to tell you, uh, okay, I would have never thought of uh, that as a ministry. Is a mission field. They're new mission, international missionary board mem missionaries to Osaka, Japan. And uh, they're studying Japanese. Uh, they're going to be uh, missionaries to the Japanese people, uh, which has really become the home of VR, which I think is the reason that they are there. Uh, Mr. Daniel, good morning to you. I pray all is going well in your work world today. You get home you got to give everybody a hug. Uh, Miss Debbie, your mom's uh, holding down the fort, hugs and kisses all around, but you got to do your part when you get home, all right? Uh, so at any rate, they're there, and uh, they have locked into the virtual world. They go into virtual reality and then into the chat rooms and, and the various places, and there they make relationships with people. Good morning, Miss Katie. Is Anna? Uh, hope everyone is doing well today. I pray they are as well, my dear friend. Uh, virtual reality evangelism isn't uh, really any different, they say, than regular evangelism. Uh, Justin talks about it. He says you just find that point, common point of interest. Uh, build a relationship and draw the conversation to the gospel. If you remember right, Michaela said yesterday that... Uh, a lot of the people that are in the chat rooms in VR are hurting, lonely, uh, secluded. They've cut themselves basically off from uh, human contact uh, as much as they can. Uh, they're, many of them are, are seeking, but, but they're hurting. Uh, they're frightened. So they retreat to the virtual world where they can uh, express themselves uh, and it is there that you're going to be probably very open, my guess is. Uh, bartender friend of mine uh, years ago used to say that people come into the bar that he never knows, and they tell him things that uh, uh, they would never tell anybody else. Uh, he became their confidant. He would become their counselor. And they would pour their heart out to him for that evening that they were there. And then off they would go, never to see him again, perhaps. But uh, uh, I think that's the way it is in virtual reality. I don't have to see these people face to face. I'm looking at their avatar, and I can open myself up and express myself. What an avenue. Sometimes the hardest thing it is that I have when I'm witnessing to people is to get them to open up and really see what's inside, where the pain and, and, and where the hurt is. <laughs> I got to tell you, the absolute truth of it all uh, is that, that this fits the very definition of evangelism, of soul winning, because it doesn't happen unless we make a connection with people, lost person or a, a saved person. We have to connect. <laughs> now again, I, I'll be honest with you. I would have never thought a virtual reality is an avenue of evangelism. Well, I've learned something. Something valuable. 
that added even deeper to my understanding that there are more ways of reaching people than I could ever conceive, and that certainly fits that definition of it all. I thought VR was just silly video games. I say that because uh, years ago we had uh, an Atari, and I got hooked on one particular video game called River Raid. And I'd come home from work, we'd eat dinner, and Sharon and I'd sit down and I'd play River Raid. I'd play River Raid and, and, uh, until 3 or 4 in the morning, get up and, and take a nap or get a shower, go to work, come home and start again. I got hooked on it. And I guess that's one of the things I've been uh, avoided playing video games and stuff when the kids are playing because of this obsessive personality I have that I would get... I would get uh, absolutely hooked on it but i see something different in this that thrills me and uh intrigues me well i guess that's that, that's enough of that for the time being uh i want us to uh uh take a moment to uh, to go to prayer and and open ourselves up for this day all right father i thank you that we can come to you, sovereign, blessed, mighty God. Lord, I thank you that you created us in your image, which means, Lord, that since our God is a creative God, imaginative, I look at all the various animals. Who would have imagined a duck-billed platypus? But you did. Who would have imagined an elephant? But you did. A giraffe? But you did. Who would have imagined man? But you did. You're imaginative, and God, you're creative. And that part of your nature has been planted in us. And I believe in each and every one of us there is a, a desire to create. A desire to, uh, to make beauty. It comes out in different places. Because you put different talents and different gifts and different abilities in people. Different interests. And Lord, you want to use every bit of that to your glory and to fulfilling your amazing mission. And Lord, we come to you. I thank you for all that are here. And pray, Lord, that you will bless us and lead us and guide us in wisdom and truth, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it's good to see everybody. Ah, uh, Teresa, good morning to you. It is good to see you there this morning. Uh, let's see, where are we at? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, God's intent uh, for uh, Israel in the beginning was to do what? Do you remember? Do you remember what God's intent was? He created a people set them aside to bring glory and, and, and honor to him. Uh, he desired them to serve him. When he called them out of Egypt, if you, if you will, he called Abraham out uh, that Abraham might serve him. But he called Israel out of Egypt, told Pharaoh, let my people go, that they might serve me, that they might worship me. And part of that service had to do with God's intent for Israel, not only to serve him, not only to bring glory to him, but God's intent for Israel was to be on the forefront of his global mission to reach all of mankind with the gospel. But you see, Israel took their privileged position and they squandered it. They wasted it on themselves. They turned inward and saw themselves as a uh, 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 a nation that was so uh, separate 
that everything else out there was unclean that they couldn't touch or, or, or speak to or, or, or work with. But that wasn't God's intent. God's intent was for them to be the blessing to all the nations of the world. Isn't that right? Isn't that what God said to Abraham, that I'm going to raise up you know, a seed, an offspring, and your offspring, your seed, will be the blessing of the whole world? He intended Israel to be the blessing of the world, to bring the oracles of God to the world. In other words, the law, the word of God. Ultimately, to bring the Messiah that would, would bless. And, and he did all of that, did he not? But he intended them to carry the message of God's love and grace to the nations around them. Not to become part of those nations. Not to, to, to uh, intermarry and, and, and to become one with the other nations. No, to be separate from them. But at the same time, to engage them and present to them God in all of his mercy, his loving kindness, which is the first character trait of God that he reveals to us. But they didn't do it. So what did God do? Ultimately, he took Israel and put them on the shelf and said to Israel, you know, we'll deal with you later. Michael, good morning to you. I'm sure you are at work. Pray your day is going well. Put Israel on a shelf. We'll look at that when we get back to Romans and uh, chapter 11. For a time being, and then he said, I'm going to turn my attention to the Gentile, and I'm going to take the word to them. And ultimately, Israel, through the church, uh, those 12 and, and 120, and the, and the church carried the gospel to the world and to the Gentile, right? And ultimately, uh, the age of the Gentile came to its fruition during our lifetime. The day's going to come at the end of this indeterminate period of time where God's going to take Israel down and say, okay, now it's your turn. We're going to deal with this issue once and for all. But for now, God has attend, turned his attention to the world, and it is now the church that God intends to use to reach the world with the gospel. Fundamental to the New Testament teaching on the church is that all believers have an important part to play in the extension of the kingdom of God. Uh, we all have a, a, a role to play in God's global kingdom outreach, his impact on the world. And as such, there is no such thing as an insignificant action. We all know the Great Commission, authority, all authorities we can give it me in heaven and earth. Go therefore as he delegates his authority to you, to me, to the church, and make disciples of all ethnos, all people group, all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do all that I have taught you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. So we have a role. And I would tell you, no action that you take in reaching the world for the gospel is insignificant. Go with me to Matthew and chapter 25. I hear those pages rustling. I, I, I praise God for all of you that are out there. Wow, it's good to see you all this morning. You're out there and you're not signing in. That's, that's okay. You don't have to, but we'd love to have you do it at any rate. Matthew 25. You there? Now go down and look at verses 34, 34 through 40. Starting at 34, it says, And then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. In prison, and you came to me. No, well, I guess I ought to back up a little bit. Our goal this year for our Lottie Moon International Mission response is... 8,005. Look at what God did at one Sunday. Do you see that? 
Look what God did in one Sunday. If that doesn't put a smile on your face or put an awe in your awe or a wow on your lips or a boing in your eyes, better than 40% of the way. Look what he had, 36.51 in one Sunday. Isn't God amazing? He gets all the glory, my friends. I wonder what he's going to do this Sunday and the Sunday after. Miss Jessica, good morning to you and to Miss Sadie and to uh, to your mama. It's uh, If she's there, I don't know whether Betsy's still there or not, but good morning if she is. Do you see that? Wow. Anyway, let's go back on. Let's go back to those verses. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed, my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, I love that, the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you gave me, or I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous, the church is going to say, we'll answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these my brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. You know those food baskets that was prepared and given to those children in Davu City? That many of you saw the video, in fact I think maybe, you know, I don't know how many, but I played it a couple of times, saw the video of handing out the, the Christmas baskets with food in them. You did it unto me. I want you to think about the impact of those words for a moment. When you do even the little things, and you do it for the sake of Christ and for his kingdom, it's as if you are ministering directly to Jesus. I don't know exactly how to get my head around it. I've known these verses for years. I've studied them. I've preached on them. I understand what they're saying on one level. But I can't say that I understand them on the, on the depth and the level that they have to go. Oh, one day, one day when I see him face to face, I will understand more deeply than I certainly do now. When you do, good morning, Miss Laura, and I believe Mr. Chris is still with you this morning, so good morning, good morning to you. Simply put, how many of you have the power to give someone in need a sandwich? Or a bottle of water to someone that's thirsty? Can you befriend a stranger or visit someone who's sick or in need? of a word of encouragement? What about that person that's standing in line ahead of you and they're, they're trying to, uh, to purchase something? They've got a couple of little kids and uh, you know it, it's obviously that they're struggling and they're sorting through their things to see what they need to put back in order to be able to take. What, what's the most necessary thing you know, that, that, that I have to keep and others that I have to give away? How many of us have the ability, not everybody, I understand, have the ability to say, listen, don't worry about it. Put that all back on the counter. Let me take care of it. Let me take care of it because God has taken care of me so beautifully. Do we have that ability? How many of us have the ability to soothe the hurt of a, of a hurting child or reach out and meet a need of a family? 
Ah, Chris is on his way to D.C. He's in the aerial plane going zoom all the way to Z.C. All right. Can you befriend a stranger? Can you visit someone who's sick and in need of encouragement? Oh, well, you know, we, we need to stay away from people who are sick because of COVID. And, you know, I understand some of the mindset that has been created. But guess what they do have? And I don't have it in front of me. My wife steals it from me every morning because, uh, uh, you know, it turns it off and keeps it in her possession. But all of us have that little box we can hold up to our ear and make that call. Cool. Do you have the ability to give a jacket to a person that's cold or in need, or a blanket. Y you see where I'm going with this? These are relatively simple tasks, but they all carry eternal ramifications. When doing them, you are directly doing them to the master, and they carry great eternal rewards. Now, the body of Christ, the church, is made up of a variety of people who possess a variety of gifts, all of which are necessary for the church to function properly. The church's task can't be accomplished by one individual. All of us must work together to advance you know, God's global mission impact, every one of us. We are teamed up together. I've said it once, I'm going to say it again. There is no insignificant member of the church. Everybody has a role to play. Well, somebody said, well, I'm, 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 I'm too old or too sick or, 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 or too timid or too what. Uh, all right, going to go there again. Miss Carolyn, you know, get ready. Can you do this? <sighs> Can you suck air? Are you still breathing? If so, then God has a purpose uniquely designed for you. Many play incredible, significant roles behind the scenes doing things that none of us ever know about. And that's the way they like it. Totally anonymous. Others, because of the nature of what needs to be done, are out in front and people see it and everything. And sometimes they come up and pat you on the back and say, good job. And that's where we have the opportunity to turn the attention where it really belongs. To the one who gave us the strength, the energy, the power, the initiative, the, in, uh, the uh, ingenuity, the creativity, the imagination to do those things. Furthermore, all who work to achieve the ends for which the Father has created his church will be rewarded, no matter the particular part they play in this kingdom advance. The truth is taught clearly in Scripture. Even the tiniest service does not go unnoticed. Those who simply give someone a drink of cold water ministers to Christ an inexpensive act of hospitality is not forgotten. <laughs> Listen to Jesus' missionary discourse in Matthew 10. Flip back there. Just go, beep, 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 just a few pages. And then go down to uh, 40 through 42. He who receives me, receives you, as he's sending them out, receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receives a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of the disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Jesus has called his disciples to ministry and has prepared them for the inevitable opposition from a fallen world. But what about those who follow the Savior and yet lack skills, gifts, and qualifications to engage in full-time Christian service? How can they extend the gospel? Well, Jesus answers those questions in verses 40 through 42 by promising great reward for all those who support his emissaries. 
Jesus promises great reward for simply receiving his workers. And to receive them meant to support them. Because in those days, those workers went around, and there weren't there weren't you know hotels and motels and 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 uh, uh, Carl's Juniors and all of these other places around. No, their all homes were opened up to the hospitality of these traveling ministers. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Providing room and board for a. Uh, for his full-time students or even when the call comes out anybody got room to put up a international student from the BSM uh, that's an opportunity that a person has God said deserves a prize so does uh, adding in, in in financial support not because the messages of themselves are worthy but because to do such for Christ's sake is to treat the Lord the same way. You're supporting him, not them. The work that is called, not them. You're, you're giving to him. When we take up these mission offerings, it isn't you're not giving to Hall Boulevard Baptist Church. You're not giving to me. You're giving to him. You're not even giving to missions. Well, you are. But ultimately, it is a gift unto him that he multiplies. There's a strong connection between Christ and his people. So much so that what we do to any believer, what we do to the Savior. Well, even if you're not in full-time ministry staff yourself, to serve Jesus himself, when we, we provide for the gospel extension through our prayers and through our support, Paul acknowledges that believers in Philippi were partners together with him in the advancement of the gospel. They were concerned for him. They prayed for him. They lifted him up. There wasn't a, a day went by they didn't encourage and pray him. And, 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 and more than once or twice, they sent offerings to help sustain him. They were partners. When somebody came to faith in Christ because of Paul, they were a part of that. What he means by that is simply as they prayed for him and gave and supported that ministry, it was as if they were on the field with him, reaping the rewards of that joint effort. Christ values the aid offered to his people. Not according to the cost of the gift, but according to the love and affection of the giver. Only a small percentage of Christians are really called to full-time Christian service, but we are all called to full-time Christian service. You say, now, wait a minute, you're just contradicting yourself. No, I didn't. Some are called to be vocationally in ministry full-time or part-time. But all are called to full-time Christian service. Yet those who don't work on a foreign mission field or serve as a full-time or part-time minister to church are, are maybe in many ways more vital to the extension of the gospel than any others. Because you all create the foundation from which that person works. Without you, they couldn't be on the mission field. They couldn't do that which God put in front of them to do. Any more than, than, than a pastor could be sustained if the church wasn't supported by God's people. That means that each and every believer, no matter their years of experience or their gifts and talents or their lack thereof, everyone has great value in the kingdom of God and for the advancement of the gospel. Besides working diligently in their jobs and evangelizing those in their lives and praying for the growth of the kingdom, volunteering in, 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 as, as a servant in the church, giving you know, for, for outreach, for the reaching of people with the gospel, are all ways that we can fulfill Christ's call. Well, what does it take to reach the lost? Does it happen simply by happenstance or by accident? 
Well, we're going to look at something today. We reach the lost through research. Now, I know we, we, we you say, well, research, what do you mean by that? Well, Project 3000 researches and pursues people on the very edge of lostness. You see, in order for us to know where to plant a missionary, where to equip and to train a missionary to go, we need to know something about the group they're going into. That does does not happen by accident. It takes some research, it takes some penetration into that group to begin to understand what that, how to best reach that group. Planes, trains, buses, motorcycles, cars, boats. Well, whatever it takes to get them as close as possible. And then many set off on foot to find hidden people groups. The mission, International Mission Board, their missionaries are going the extra mile, quite often, literally. Why? Because they're penetrating into the deepest parts of lostness, a place where nobody is looking for these people to be able to make sure that they have an opportunity to hear the life-giving good news that Jesus saves and can move us from perishing to everlasting life. And it takes research. Something the IMB already conducts at the highest level possible. Project 3000, out of the 7,000 plus people groups, Project 3000 are engaging and attempting to engage over 3,000 of these unengaged, unreached people groups. And we're told that of that number, 784 groups have no scripture in their heart language. So that means that there's going to be a, a, a drive in there to... To, to make their language a written language where the scripture can be accurately written for that people group. New missionary explorers will be journeying into unknown places to find out where they live, to learn their culture, to discern their literacy, develop ministry strategies to help people partner with the task, to learn how best to storytell Ray Henry Holliday, who is part of your prayer guide today, is in the pioneering group of Project 300 Explorers. And he reveals, he, he travels with the national partners to remote areas in South Asia for six weeks at a time to live among one of ten people groups. Once they arrive in a general area, they find transportation and accommodation. And Holiday compares his job to how Jesus sent out the 72. They go with minimal supplies. Basically, he says, carrying his home on his back. And he collects as much demographic information as he can and builds relationships. While well, he uses a translator he also takes time to study the people's language. And during his university years, Holiday served in Central Asia with the IMB's hands-on program, and he thought he'd head back to a Central Asian country, but when he heard of Project 3000's job description, he was on the edge of a burden of prayer that the Lord had placed on his heart years earlier. As a high school student, Holiday prayed from Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Here am I, send me. The verse was shared at an IMG job conference when Project 3000 assignment was presented. It further confirmed his calling. It's a hard job, and that's part of the reason why I felt called to it. He said, I feel like I have a gifting and ability in this area, and there's a great need. 
one that not too many folks can do. So, today we pray for Holiday as he and other Project 3000 missionaries scout out and research their people groups. We need to pray that the Lord will open the heart of these unreached, unengaged people groups and pray God will call more people to serve through Project 3000. They're trusting Jesus will finish his mission. Now, I have a video for you today. Now, I will tell you, this video doesn't have to do with holiday and doesn't have to do completely with Project 3000. And the reason for that is the areas that they go into and the people groups that they meet, they can't photograph. They can't uh, make a video of them. It's uh, forbidden at this point. It's dangerous. And it would be unwise. But I don't want you to miss the idea of going in and what it takes sometimes to get to some of these people groups, some of these areas. So I'm reaching back into FUBE, which is a uh, uh, International Mission Board uh, mission adventure to reach into unreached people groups and tie in and go beyond taking information learned from Project 3000 and building upon it. Join us. In Sorry, grab the wrong one. The Bible says, I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. God loves all people. We were created in God's image. Sadly, there are many people in this world who don't know that love. Churches all across the United States send IMB missionaries like Kenny and Cheryl to go live among people in places where Jesus is not known. One of those unreached people groups is the Embarer people. The Embera of Panama are a tribal people who live in the Darlin province in the southeast corner of the country. Much of the Embera are historically from Colombia, but because of violence, many of them fled to Panama. In 2016, God really opened doors to evangelizing this area. A team came up here to share Bible stories, not even sure if they would be allowed to get out of the boat, and ended up baptizing 18 people. From that trip, they formed the Aventuras Haki team. This team provides and supports local indigenous missionaries to live in the area and provide a continuous missionary presence. Not only does this team speak the language, know the culture, and can move around in restricted areas better than we can, they have a heart for the people because they too are in Vera. Eh, mi nombre es Raquel. My name is Raquel. I am from Panama and a part of the Embera People Group. I hope with my whole heart that Embera people of Panama can know God and have a relationship with Him. How can the Embera know God loves them and that they are wonderfully made if no one will go and tell them, if they have no access to the gospel? Our hope in prayer is that through these Bible stories, they will come to know Jesus and have a relationship with Him, and not only tell their friends and family, but when they travel back home to Colombia, they will share this good news with their loved ones. I want them to know that we are a part of something bigger, that we have no idea how much we can do together. What we do as the body of Christ has a greater impact than we could ever imagine. Maybe it is just someone praying, that is so important when reaching out to the unreached. Others give their time, money, whatever they have. It plays a specific role in God's plan. I know that I am supposed to go. I don't know what your part is, but we must all be faithful to whatever role God has called us to. We are like the hands and feet of God that go and show the love He has to people who don't know Him. I couldn't have said it any better. And Terry, I agree with you. Reading uh, Elizabeth uh, Elliot's book, 
uh, and, and, and the books that uh, deal with Jim Elliott and uh, his, his martyrdom along with those back in the 50s will really be an inspiration to you. Uh, Jesus said, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. It doesn't say the gospel should be or might be, but will be preached. And that, my friend, is the Great Commission. It's the great certainty, the great commandment, the great confidence. The grace of missionary service is as irresistible as the grace of regeneration. Christ can promise universal proclamation because he's sovereign. He knows the future success of missions because he makes the future all nations will hear. And we, by the grace of God, are part of it. Uh, we're going to be seeing a prayer blurb on the indigenous peoples of, 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 of an area, since that's what we're talking about, these unreached people groups, that our missionaries go at a great risk, especially in the beginning, like Project 3000. And like these who, who make that first foray to bring the gospel in to those people groups. And then we'll pray. Join us in thanking God for an answered prayer among the indigenous peoples of northeastern Brazil. God opened a door among an indigenous tribe in northeastern Brazil. Animistic beliefs kept this tribe closed to the gospel. After local believers started praying and intentionally building relationships, the tribal leaders welcomed the friendships and the gospel. Let's pray together with a worker. Let's join together thanking God for the work that he's doing among indigenous peoples of northeastern Brazil. Revelation 3.8 says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. Father God, we thank you for the work that you're doing among indigenous peoples of northeastern Brazil. Thank you that local believers began praying for one tribe and intentionally built relationships with them. Thank you that the tribal leaders gave permission for outsiders to come in. And thank you, Lord, that a Bible storying group is happening in one tribal leader's home. We thank you for the transforming power of the gospel that's being displayed among these people and pray that you would continue to bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I want to thank you so much for our time together this morning to open your word and let your word speak to our heart and encourage us. And again, affirm to us your call to reach the world. I thank you for Project 3000, and I thank you for those uh, who are engaged in that ministry. Lord, uh, going uh, into very uh, remote places, uh, risking a great deal to go into uh, tribal areas where indigenous people live that have not been impacted or influenced by the gospel, contacting them many times for the first time with the gospel. God, studying them, getting to understand them, uh, knowing something of their language. And Father, figuring out methods and ways of moving missionaries into those areas to bring light and life. God will love you as these people penetrate the deepest parts of darkness as we think and uh, consider it in the world. We pray for their protection. I pray for those missionaries that are on the forefront of uh, reaching unreached people groups, uh, reaching to the very ends of the earth, and they are the ends of the earth. Lord, I pray for those that live in our nation, Lord, and are trying to impact unreached people groups here, because there are. Oh, I know, Lord, as a country, we have the gospel readily available to us, but there are those who have never heard, never understood, never known about the name of Jesus that we are to go to. I thank you for our offering. I thank you for the goal that you set for us, Lord, and I thank you for what you are doing. And, and watching your hand at work in this, we glorify you, Lord. And we sit anxiously anticipating what you are going to do. 
God, may this energize us to go beyond or do more than we think we can do, Lord, individually. Lord, might we just be the people that you want us to be and know that, Lord, whatever we do and whatever we give, we give unto you. God, we thank you and we praise you now. Lead us today, Lord. Use us to give that cup of water or that sandwich or that that kind word, whatever it is, Lord, out to someone, knowing that if we do it to the least of these, we have done it unto you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen and amen. Well, I pray you're enjoying these studies, and I'm trying to keep the time down, but it's it's it gets away from us. But uh, God bless you. It's good to have you here this morning. We'll be back tomorrow at uh, at uh, little time, is it nine o'clock in the morning? By the way, if you're around at eleven, uh, what is it? Eleven uh, o'clock? Uh, Seekers breakfast at Davidson's. Uh, take a look at it in the bulletin. It's there. I can never keep my time straight. It's either 11, 11, 30. I think it's 11. Uh, let's join together. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Let's join together. Let's have a good time. Let's fellowship together. What a crowd we had last month. Let's have a crowd again this month. God bless you. We love you, and we'll see you then.